Mrs. Wright, thank you so much for giving us your time once again, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to get started by sharing my screen, and hopefully this will work out great. Okay. And then present. All right. Uh, so tonight I kind of want to just talk about how we as parents support our kids going through um, this, these steps of college uh, searching and figuring out how the application process works. And I say we because I have five kids and um, I actually have a rising senior. This will be my fourth rising senior uh, to go through this process. And we were just talking about college again today. Um, and so hopefully uh, I'll be able to share some things that you have been thinking about and things that I have been through already. And if this is the first time, obviously I welcome the questions, but um, we'll go over a lot of the ones that were already submitted hopefully in here. And then uh, after we'll take some more. Okay, how does this work? There, Oop. there we go. All right, so there's different kinds of college uh, applications. Some of you may be familiar, but I always get questions about it. So early decision, this sneaks up on people really quickly. It's one of those things that you're gonna have to be preparing for over the summer. Early decision is binding. It means that if you apply to that school and you 100% get in, they are expecting you to go. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that you can get out of a, an early decision, and it mostly would be financial. For instance, if you thought that you were going to get a better financial aid package and didn't, then you can say it wasn't you know, as affordable. But from our area, financial aid packages are a little more rare than they are, say, from like inner city or more rural areas where the earning uh, potential is not as high in families. This is a binding decision for you. Early action is really different. You apply early, you are considered to be um, an aggressively like eager student to go to this school. But that said, if you are applying to a UC and you're applying early action to somewhere else, they totally understand that, you know, well, I did get into the UC of my choice and so that's where I'm going to go. That's uh, acceptable. It's not binding, but it does give you that demonstrated interest. Then regular decision, um, this says typically in the spring, but the deadlines can be in January. A lot of deadlines are a little bit earlier. Um, you know, highly selective schools like our kids like can be in the later fall. They're not binding. And typically what they say the difference is between like early action and regular decision is the size of the pool, not necessarily the quality of the student. So if you get, you know, 30% of kids that apply early action may get into a school uh, and out of their regular decision pool, they only take 10%. It doesn't mean that those 30% that got in weren't as highly qualified or were more highly qualified. It just means that in an early action pool, you have more highly qualified students, typically, if that helps explain it. Rolling admissions, there's plenty of really good schools out there that will take uh, admissions all throughout the spring and into the summer. So for instance, Arizona State or Rutgers, Penn State, we get kids that go there all the time. If you happen to be among those kids that every year apply to schools that they are, um, that are more reach schools for them, um, that they aren't as likely to get into and they don't have any safety schools, there is a way to apply later if you didn't get into any of your first round choices. Okay, benefits of applying early action or early decision, you do have better odds. Uh, sometimes there are incentives like uh, better, I don't know, financial aid packages or you qualify for an earlier round of financial aid or scholarships if you apply early, or you'll get better selections on the dorms that you wanna live in, or um, you know, you'll get to pick your courses earlier, things like that. Plus you have all the pressure off and you do a little bit better on your finals. 
uh, applying for honors programs typically also are coinciding with getting in on those early applications. And one thing I like to point out is that a, three, a student with a 3.5 GPA is considered an honor student at almost every college across the country, uh, except our RUCs because they are so, so impacted. So there's lots of other schools around there. All right. If you have grades that you're waiting on, I know there's a lot of um, concern about the grades from this year. And if you're waiting for that first semester of senior year when the students are back in you know, regular classes again, we hope, fingers crossed, uh, then you might be better off waiting for a regular decision to show the uh, colleges the upward trajectory in your grades. So that things are improving and this is kind of who you really are. And um, it was more difficult when you weren't able to go to classes in person. So if you're that kind of a student, that's something else to consider. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, colleges are looking for. There's always that question. They look overall at the grades that you have in all of your courses, regardless of whether they were AP or not, they're looking at all of the courses that you've taken and the grades and your GPA unweighted. Uh, we talk a lot about what the different GPAs mean if you go on infinite campus. And the truth is most colleges will recalculate your GPA to suit their needs. Uh, like the UCs, we already know what they're gonna do. So you have a specific A through G GPA that would be applicable to the UCs and CSUs. They take out health, they take out PE. Those aren't grades they're as concerned about. Other schools, especially by major, may focus more on math or they may focus more on um, your weighted classes or they may focus more on you know how high you went in, I don't know, languages or something like that. Every college will recalculate based on, you know, the criteria that's most important to them and they don't always share what that criteria is. So of our three GPAs, we have one that's unweighted. Uh, not all colleges will weight the grades of honors or AP classes. We have one that's weighted. Lots of colleges do take that one. That's gonna be all of your honors and AP classes in there. And then we have one that's specific for the A through G and that's specific to the California. There's another GPA that's a Cal grant and that is specific to financial aid. Okay, so there's your grades and all your courses. Then they're gonna look more strongly at your college prep courses, your AP courses, your advanced courses, the rigor that you've taken. At our school, we do have a lot of uh, courses that you can take advantage of more than there would be available, say at like my high school, where there were a couple of honors classes and absolutely no AP classes where I went to high school. So they have to weight those equally. That wasn't something that was allowed to us, but at Doherty, because there's so much available, they're hoping that you will take advantage of some of those and the areas that you took them in, especially related to the major you're seeking. Um, so that speaks to your strength of curriculum. Admission te test scores, that's gonna be in red. Right now, that's kind of up in the air, right? We don't know if test scores are going to be required for next year or not, because we don't know if people are gonna be able to take them. We know that the trend has been to permanently make many schools um, absolutely test optional. And uh, the UCs, that was one of the, you know, we had several questions about that. The UCs cannot and will not even consider or look at your test scores in relation to admissions. There is no need to submit them uh, because they, they will not look at them. As far as subject scores, it used to be that some majors at Berkeley would occasionally look at a math score, a, a math subject test or take into consideration. But at this point, they have made the decision to keep things equitable among those students who cannot afford or do not have access to the, uh, these kinds of tests, then they're not gonna look at them for anyone. The test doesn't show learning potential, it shows what you had the ability to learn in high school and not everyone had the same ability. So some schools will still take them, they will consider them and they're called test optional. Uh, test optional means that if you 
took the test, it will not put you in at a higher level than a student who didn't. And if you did not take the test, it cannot be held against you in any way compared to a student that did. It is added information. It is another way of saying the same thing that your GPA says, that you're a good student, All right? So it can add strength to it by validating something they already knew. By and large, from my opinion, uh, they know Doherty. Colleges that I talk to, Harvard, MIT, Yale, they know our kids already. And they know what kind of students we have here and they know the rigor of the curriculum. Not all AP classes are created equal. <laughs> so because of that, they know the strength of our students. And so uh, it is still okay to take the tests. If, it's, if the campus is test optional, they will look at them but it will only validate and it cannot put you at a higher place than a student who doesn't take it. So hopefully that helps clarify it. Uh, the next thing of importance is that uh, essay or writing sample. We spend a lot of time on essays in, uh, in order to really get those kids to that vulnerable place where they're really feeling, the admissions people are really able to feel connected to the students. So we spend a lot of time figuring out how they can weave in the activities and the experiences of their life with the point that they wanna make, which usually is what are their strongest values, um, what kind of student they're gonna be and how they solve problems. So your counselor letters of recommendation, I had somebody ask about the format of those. And to be honest, the format can change from school to school. And uh, colleges have different preferences. Some of them like a written letter in paragraph form. Some of them really appreciate a more recent development of a bullet point form. But in general, for our purposes, a counselor letter recommendation is more like a floodlight over the entire school and your student has they function in it. So it says, you know, at our school, for instance, uh, Model UN is a really big club. And the fact that this student has a leadership position in Model UN is really saying something because it's a great big club and carries a lot of weight. At another school, it may not be such a big thing. There may be three people in the club total. And so everyone's got a leadership position. That's the kind of floodlight. The teacher letter of recommendation by contrast is more of a spotlight. They know the student every day. They see their growth and development over the course of the year. And they are able to talk about how they solved problems, helped peers, uh, worked in groups, all of those kinds of things because they have that relationship. So both letters are important. Um, and if you don't feel like you have a super strong relationship with your counselor or the students don't because they don't see them every day, that, that isn't as uh, relevant to the counselor's letter because they will have the information packet to write from and they are writing more about what kind of school it, it is and how that student fit into the school. Okay, so there you have your AP scores. Um, notice that it's a lot further down. It's less about the score that they got and more about the rigor of the class that they took. That said, I think it was uh, UCLA's admissions rep that said they're always a little surprised by kids who take the AP class but don't take the AP test. It makes them wonder why, but it's not as important as the grade they get in the AP class. Uh, student interest and demonstrated interest is like visits to the campus and communication with the admissions rep. These things are more important at less selective schools than at the really, really selective schools because they know that our kids all want to go to those schools. Some schools hold it really uh, at a high level of importance and other schools don't put as much emphasis on it. But if you are applying to a school that's local and you were able to visit that campus, again, when campuses are open, um, it's a little more meaningful. There's lots of other ways, and we'll talk about those later, um, that you can get familiar with college campuses you're considering. Extracurricular activities, we'll talk a little bit more about what kinds, but you can see that 
uh, that plays a role as well. And when it comes to competitive schools, the students that they're selecting from all have the same kinds of GPAs, the same rigor in their coursework. They're coming to the table fairly unified. So the places that they can stand out now, once they've made that initial cut, you know, they have the grades, they, it looks like they can handle the work here. Two places that you can make a difference is the quality of the essay and the time they put into it and the extracurricular activities. So if your student doesn't have a lot of extracurricular activities now, and I know it's a little bit more of a challenge these days than it was say last year at this time, uh, but they don't have a lot now, they can start things that they would be able to reference in an essay and say, I've been doing this since my junior year. So if your student is struggling to find things to do or ways to uh, look into their, look into getting some relevant work experience in their field of study, um, they're welcome to contact me and set up an appointment. I meet with students all day. We've got lots of juniors that are coming in right now, uh, but take advantage of it and we can kind of see, you know, where areas of weakness that you still have time to do something about. Because again, we've got, you know, almost a year before applications will be due. And this is a good time to kind of beef things up. All right, some students will do interviews. Uh, portfolio, if you're going into a uh, performance or, uh, you know, an artistic field of some kind, relevant work experience, and then the subject scores are down there at the bottom. And again, it really pays to do some research because I've seen a lot of kids take these subject tests and they just haven't been relevant for anywhere. Some, some schools will still take them as uh, optional and others won't even consider them because they just don't have the time. So make sure it's relevant to your field of study and to your um, uh, school that you're applying to. This is right. Can I um, jump in really quick on two quick things? Yeah. One is um, I understand as of today's College Board announcement, they're not even going to give the subject tests anymore. So I think there's just a minor exception for international students for a short time. Okay. The second was, um, there was a question clarifying, what is a college prep course? If you can briefly speak to that. And I think it's oh. because so many of our students only do college prep. It's hard to, it's, it's, right. PE, it's pre-algebra, but if you could speak to briefly what the mm -hmm. definition of college prep is. So college prep courses are, are kind of a level that is meant to prepare students for the workload that they will have at college, right? So it's preparatory. There are some students, uh, you know, in maybe remedial type classes or special ed type classes, special day classes, things like that, who are still able to graduate from high school taking two years of math, but that math level might not be at um, a college prep level. They wouldn't be ready for a call, an initial college uh, level math class, right? College algebra is supposed to come after algebra two, maybe after pre-calculus, and then you would go into a college algebra class. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how the call, and we don't have a lot of students that are in those relative to the, um, you know, the student body percentages, but there are students that take advantage of, of the non-prep classes as a means of, um, you know, graduating from high school if the college prep courses are beyond their grasp at that point. That would include things like some electives and PE, right? Because we require it for graduation, but the colleges don't. So if right. you have an PE or a C in PE, it doesn't affect your GPA with respect to the recalculated when they're focused on college prep. Right, right. So PE, health, anything that's not required for that college admission, um, but are required for high school graduation as well as remedial type coursework. And we have pretty good clarity on what the UCs and CSUs consider in their calculating. So you can figure that out. And in fact, I think we've done a calculation for that right on the transcripts. But when it comes to privates, 
you don't know. So you give them whatever the GPA is listed and then they recalculate it based on what's important to them, which probably is pretty similar to UCs, I would think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all right. Okay, just to give you an idea of some of the things that I do in the College and Career Center, if there are questions about that. Now, um, I thought I'd throw this in there. I can help with, uh, with career ideas. Um, I always like to see somebody who comes in that does, you know, maybe doesn't know or is, is having a hard time deciding and will evaluate careers, not just on, you know, what do you want to do, but also what's in demand, what kind of living do you want to make, how far do you want to go in education, things like that. Um, obviously, college, uh, picking colleges and things like that. I spend a lot of the fall reviewing essays and applications, um, helping with majors. Test prep used to be a big part of it. <laughs> we don't know anymore. Uh, I post jobs and volunteer opportunities as I get them. We have a huge listing of summer programs. I'm not really allowed to like upsell them to uh, students again because of equity issues, but I do keep the listing and that's posted online on the website as well. Uh, I post a lot with scholarships, financial aid, and we'll do some financial aid workshops and things like that. I'm going to start this week teaching Naviance so that the juniors will know how to use those next year because without exception, every senior will have to use Naviance. Um, we'll hold a lot of college visits. They were all virtual this year, but we still got well over 100 colleges uh, to come and see our students individually, or I guess just the Doherty students. <laughs> Um, we do a lot of workshops, presentations, one-on-one -on -one student appointments, and I do um, some parent ed events just like this one. Okay. And on my website is the link if you have students that want to make appointments. All right. Lots of options after school. You've probably seen something like this before, but once you get out of high school, it isn't necessarily, you know, straight on to university. You can also go to community college. People always say, don't we get the biggest number of kids going to uh, Berkeley from our school? And I say, no, the biggest number of kids go to DVC every year. Usually over a hundred kids will go to DVC. And simply, you know, the courses are more accessible, less impacted, uh, obviously it's free. Um, and they have a better chance as a transfer student getting into the school of their choice. So we do get a lot of students that go to community college and DVC is one of them, but there's also like 23 other community colleges throughout. I think there's more than that. Vocational and career tech, uh, to get out into the working world faster, you learn the skill that you want and head straight out. Many of them are paying salaries competitive with college graduates. So, also another alternative. And then military. Uh, we do get students every year that will go to the military as well. Okay. Uh, after graduation, professional school, if you've got, uh, you know, a degree that you'll need to take after that, like law or medicine, you go to graduate work or doctorates, uh, there's a lot of kids that will come in and say, you know, I'm interested in psychology and I have to point out, well, in order to do the job that you're thinking, you're going to need a doctorate or you're going to need, you know, a certificate of some kind in, from graduate work. So keeping those, you know, being aware of those options and the things that you're considering can be really helpful for students and that it's not just one way to achieve their education. All right. This one's dated but last year, I think we wound up around the same. It's usually roughly between 20 and 25% of the students will go to a community college. Um, lots of them obviously in California and 100% uh, admittance for those too. So you just have to have a diploma or be over 18. Um, there, all of the things that I had just said, they're smaller classes and whatnot. I forgot these slides were in here. <laughs> Okay, and then the transfer admission guarantee program, and I have some slides on that in a second as well, but uh, it is true at the community colleges, you are usually taught by an instructor who's been a professional in that field, not just a teacher's assistant, and I tell the for better or for worse story that my daughter taught physics 
in her second year in college. She had not taken physics in high school and took one physics class in college her freshman year and then again was teaching it her sophomore year. So you think about that for the different universities uh, and if that's what you're looking for versus having an instructor who's been a professional in that field, um, there can be some advantages to community college. Okay, transfer admission guarantee. So what this means is you are guaranteed if you meet the criteria for the school, uh, you are guaranteed admissions. And the way this works is after you've accumulated 60 college credits or you've completed a year of college, for some students that can happen as they are graduating high school if they've taken a number of the AP classes. For some students, it will be you know, a full year into their college experience. They fill out an application with their educational plan for their second year so that by the time they have achieved, did I say 60, sorry, 30 credits in the first year, 30 again in the second. By the time they have achieved 60 credits, they are ready to transfer into one of these schools. They require that you have a 3.0 GPA and then you are able to get in. Some majors and some schools may require a higher GPA. I know that Davis requires a 3.4 for their computer science program and you know other schools may vary like that but this is a guarantee you absolutely know that you'll get in berkeley ucla and san diego don't participate in the tag program but it is um you know you can have some confidence that you'll be able to get into the ucs that you're interested in based on this program if you don't have that gpa like a 3.0 or whatever it is they're requiring you can still apply without the transfer admission guarantee, but um, you, know, you just apply regularly and put in your essays and a lot of students will still get into some of these schools like Santa Cruz or Merced or Riverside. Okay, four-year schools, there are like 4,000 colleges out there, tons and tons, and there are many that have a 100% acceptance rate. So if you're one of those parents that's out there thinking my kid isn't gonna get in anywhere, they will. There are plenty of schools out there and plenty of schools that have really good programs as well. There are also a lot of very selective schools and uh, the influence of students that decided to stay home this year instead or to go to a community college since classes were gonna be taught remotely instead all of those things are going to have an uh, impact on admissions both this year and next. So we don't know exactly what that will be, but we know that as things get more and more competitive, we need to explore more of the options around us. We tend at this school to think that there are only a few right choices and that's simply not the case. There are many, many choices that are great fits for our kids. Okay, UCs and CSUs. Uh, obviously there's more CSUs around. We have like 10 campuses for California uh, or for University of California. University of California prides itself on being our primary academic research. So there's a lot of uh, focus on being prepared for careers in academia through the UCs as well. Uh, CSUs, they are preparing our students for work. They're preparing them to go out into the workforce. Um, UCs, many of the classes are taught by graduate assistants. So they're graduate students. Um, two thirds of CSU students previously attended community college, just as another way to discern who you're going to school with. Um, a third, compared to a third of students that started out at the UCs or started out at community colleges that head into the UCs. Sorry, I'm stumbling. Okay, uh, UCs have a lot of other uh, advanced degrees, graduate and professional education. They'll offer bachelors and masters and professional and doctorates. Um, they do have some master's degrees taught through the CSUs as well, but they have a little bit smaller numbers on them. I think our, 
I think our numbers on this, and I'd have to double check it, are pretty equal for the number of students that wind up going to CSUs versus UCs. There's fewer UCs, so we have larger numbers that go to each campus, but in general, they're still pretty comparable. Okay. 15% attended a CSU. Uh, it's a very easy application. Doesn't take very long. There's no essays. They don't need um, the SCT or ACT for this year. We don't know what it'll do for next year, but extracurriculars don't matter as much and they use an eligibility index that's more of a mathematical equation to just figure out if you meet the criteria to apply to these schools except for Cal Poly. All right, and you can get more information on that at Cal State. Uh, yeah, 26% attend the UCs. They look for well-rounded students, which means that they're looking for those extracurriculars and their outside activities, whether it's in all of these various areas, part-time jobs also count as something that you spend your time doing. UC admissions have an online application, no matter what uh, schools you're applying to, you just fill out the one. They ask personal insight questions. So it's a little bit different setup than just doing the one big essay that you'll do for most of the other colleges around the country. They have four smaller ones. And we uh, spend some time figuring out how, you know, the different aspects of our lives that we wanna talk about in these questions. They're more of an interview. So if you got to prepare the best answer for any question you've ever been asked at an interview, this is kind of what these insight questions are. So they're, they're structured a little bit differently. They're more direct and less about creating an image in your mind of a, an experience or that kind of thing. They are getting more and more selective. Here's the numbers. This one I did update um, for this year. You can see, well, I can see that from compared to last year, the admissions numbers went down at most of the UCs. Uh, it was up over 30 for 30% uh, for a lot of them. Berkeley and LA dropped a couple percentage points last year as well. And we don't know if that trend will stay for next year, but um, we can expect that the competition will get get a little bit more <laughs> difficult as more and more students are kind of wanting to stay a little closer to home after what's happened. Okay, so there you go. And then over here, I have the numbers for the transfer admission rates. So if you go to a community college, it in most cases nearly doubles your uh, chances for getting in, which is kind of helpful to know. If you don't get into the UC of your choice, you have alternatives. Um, not every program has this, you know, like if they're going into engineering or computer science or nursing, then obviously those majors are very impacted and you wind up with, um, you know, different results. I think San Jose State's got like, a, I don't know, it's got a very high acceptance rate, except for engineering where it's like 6%. So it can be significantly smaller for these other areas. Jennifer, does this, um, just to clarify, is this their overall 2020 admission rates? These, this is not Doherty? No, this is overall. Okay, and these, so these are percentages, not the numbers. And right, yes, they have an average admission rate, 14% at Berkeley, 12 at UCLA, uh, Davis, Irvine, and San Diego, and Santa Barbara were all over 30% in 2019 and dropped. Um, and even Riverside dropped for last year. And do we, this was, and, and these are not ones that matriculated. This is just who they invited. Right. This is just who they accepted out of everyone that applied. That applied. Okay. And then the second column is if they had applied from a community college instead after their sophomore year. Okay. All right, so private California universities and colleges, uh, we usually get somewhere between, you know, nine, 10% of the class to go there as well. 
USF, Biola, there's a bunch of schools uh, in our state. They vary. They also have professional degrees. Uh, they usually have a higher acceptance rate. They will also view admissions from a holistic standpoint. So they are looking for, um, they are looking for well-rounded, they're looking for activities lists and things like that. Uh, and then they'll use the applications, the common app or coalition and, uh, those are the same applications that you'd be filling out for out-of-state schools primarily. Okay, 28% went out of state. Uh, we have a few different scholarship programs, but there are incentives for out-of-state scholarships at many of these schools. Again, if you're talking about the highly selective schools, then they do not need to offer that kind of incentive as often. Um, the schools that have tuition uh, discounts in our region, we call that the Western Undergraduate Exchange. I think there's a slide on that coming up right after this, but uh, there are many schools in our Western states that will offer near in-state tuition levels for students coming from our area. And the colleges are looking to build diversity on their campus. Um, and I say that in this audience and I don't necessarily mean students of color, but also just from different areas. So they're looking to have geographic diversity and uh, build students with a variety of interests, that kinds of things. So it's a good idea for our kids to consider out of state as well. Okay. Applications vary, there he is, okay. So Western Undergraduate Exchange, they will reduce the rate. You can look on the website for it, just Google Western Undergraduate Exchange and it will tell you the schools that participate. These are all of the states that are in our region, okay? It's a pretty big territory for us. And uh, there are schools that don't participate like Arizona State, it's a big school. They get a lot of kids, they don't participate in it. Um, University of Utah, University of Washington, those bigger <laughs> schools uh, that have a little more selective admissions rates don't always participate in it, but there will be alternative incentives for local students that want to go there. Anyway, keep that in mind and uh, look for the schools that are participating in it. Some of them will have an, a GPA requirement, like you have to have over a 3.0, others won't at all. And uh, still an excellent education and not too far from home. Okay, so you talk about the admissions rate for Stanford, and of course it actually went down this year, but because we don't know exactly where to land permanently, I've left the slide as is. Uh, tiny little acceptance rate getting into Stanford. University of Chicago, I think they went down under 10% this last year. Also tiny little acceptance rate. And Berkeley's high, high, high GPAs and high ACTs make it a big struggle. That's just where their average GPAs are after that, then they start looking holistically. So if you're in this bracket, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting in, it just means that's where they start looking. All right. This one's a little old too, but um, you can see that for these schools, Yale's the only one that, or Cornell's the only one that goes over 15 and the rest of them uh, are close to 10 or below for their acceptances at Ivy League schools. So what does that mean for us? Not all of our kids are gonna get into these schools, but there are so many other colleges out there. And generally they admit over half of their students at most colleges across the country. So there are things that will be more meaningful when you're looking for your college uh, and finding that right fit is more important than finding that brand name that you'd always thought of. Um, things to consider as you're 
looking for colleges now, if you're starting to consider putting together that list, the location of it and whether some kids are looking to get a little bit further away from mom and dad, others want to stay closer to home so that they can still see their siblings, see their parents, uh, come home to do laundry. I don't know if you want that. Anyway, you decide how far you want them to be able to go. Weather is a big player, rural and urban and suburban. Uh, I often tell the story that my niece wound up getting into Cal Poly out of Washington. She was so excited and then never really considered what the town was like and was so stunned by how small the town was that she almost didn't go. She almost didn't stay. She was thinking it was going to be more like downtown Seattle and, you know, where she was from. And it really wasn't. Uh, religious affiliations are something else to consider. Uh, we may want to make sure that the clubs or the things that we're involved with here exist on the campuses there. The size of the school makes a difference. Sometimes a small school is just what we need. We want a little more personalized attention. We want to feel like uh, we're a part of the school. Other times you want that great big, you know, football games and uh, good networks and things like that. There are huge variations. I've seen schools, uh, I think Olin Engineering, that's like got less than 500 students. Arizona State's the biggest school in the country with over 70,000 students. You pick. Price and financial aid matter. It's the first thing I tell every student when they say, I'll need a college list. I said, ask mom and dad, talk about it. Make sure you know what you have available to spend. Without exception, every year, there are so many students that come back and say, I applied to this selective school and I got in, but I can't believe they're not giving me any scholarship money. If you are applying to a selective school, it is highly unlikely that they will need to give you financial aid. So look at the costs now and see if it's realistic. If you feel like you are in a position financially, like you, you know you'll qualify for financial aid, um, then it's a little bit different story. But if you know that you won't, then uh, make sure that, that you're applying to schools that are realistic for everyone as well. And I'm thinking now there was a question about FAFSA and if you had a, a higher income level, should you, should you even apply for FAFSA? And the answer is yes. Um, I think if COVID has taught us anything, it is that we can never guarantee what's coming next. So many people out of work across the country right now, we never know. It's good fire insurance, if nothing else. You fill out that FAFSA and uh, if something should happen and your income changes, you can, you know, the student can go in and say, you have my FAFSA, my circumstances have changed. If you don't fill it out and circumstances change, you cannot go back. It opens on the 10th or the 1st, sorry, of October and it <laughs> closes on the 2nd of March next year for you guys. And um, it's always a good idea to just have it on record. There are other scholarships you may apply to at your school that you cannot apply to unless you have the FAFSA filled out. Not all scholarships are based on financial need, um, but many are as well. Other things to consider would be the political climate of the town and of the students. Um, athletics, if you want sports on campus or if you don't care, Obviously, your major, I had a girl my first year whose parents made her apply to all these prestigious schools. I can't remember how many, but it was something like 30 or 40 schools, and many of the schools did not offer her major. They just wanted to try to get in. If she listed her major, then she wouldn't have gotten in, so then she had to pick a different major, which was sad because it's not what she wanted to do. So... Keep it in mind as you're making your list that, that everything should matter, the fit should matter. And distance from home makes a difference too. There, you know, again, some that wanna go further away and others that don't. Okay. So things that you should look at or that some do, 
career services, if they've got great job placements, University of Arizona is not on this list, but they have like a 91% job placement in your dream job. Not too many schools are able to say that. And it's a pretty great uh, claim that you've got lots of these schools here. Claremont McKenna, the Claremont School is down in LA. Great, great career services. Other things, accessible professors. If you're somebody that likes to be in touch with your professors, here's some schools where you know that you'll be able to have good access to them. Here it go, there it is. All right, here we go. Happiest students. So if you're worried about your kid fitting in or feeling like they're involved or feeling like they're content with what they're doing, then these are some campuses that make, uh, that get really good marks in uh, having these happy students. You see Santa Barbara on a beach. I think I could be happy there too. There's lots of places like that. A lot of our students like Vanderbilt and Rice as well. Okay. All right, so we hear these reach target and likely. What does this mean? A reach school is a school that you might like to attend, but where your chances of admissions are lower. And what that means is if you look at their GPAs, maybe test scores if they take them, uh, and you see that your numbers are below their numbers and that their acceptance rate is lower, then you'll know that the chances may not be as good and you would call that a reach school, okay? By contrast, we call our target schools. These are colleges where your numbers look pretty much like their numbers and you probably have like a 50-50 chance. They will at least be reading your application because it meets those basic criteria. Then you can you know, focus on your essays and your extracurriculars and hope that that's going to be able to be enough to get you in. Likely, a likely school or safety, we hear it both ways, are, is a school where your numbers are going to be above the school's average numbers or they have a large acceptance rate and you feel confident that you would be among those students selected for admission. Okay. The goal is, oh, all right, we'll look at this one first. Okay, so scattergrams are now available online to juniors um, and their parents through Naviance. This, except for in-state schools, don't look at the UCs, um, this for out-of-state schools gives you an idea of students who applied and got in, these are the little green dots, uh, applied and did not get in or were waitlisted, okay? and it does it by their test scores and their average GPAs, okay? You can look at it just along the line of GPAs as well, but you can see that some fell below, some fell above and did not get in, and that means it came down to extracurricular activities and essays and you know other criteria. So we don't know everything about it, but this gives you an idea, okay? Photos old, but the information is up to date on Naviance for out of state schools and for in state privates like Chapman, anywhere that, that required um, the letters of rec, which the UCs and CSUs don't. So kids that will apply to there don't always list it on Naviance. Okay. So colleges that you should apply to 10 total. To reach. These are unlikely, so you don't need to put that many in. Five or six targets and two that are likely. Make sure that the schools that you put into your likely category are schools that you would actually attend. I see students every year that say, well, I put this in here, but it's just a safety. I'm not going to go. Well, if you're not going to go, don't apply. That's money. And time somebody else is reading it and you're taking to prepare it and make sure you do your research and pick schools that have good programs for you. Um, for students that have really high numbers that are looking at those um, competitive schools, it is tougher 
to make these appropriate target lists? What is a target for a student that has a GPA well over a 4.0? It's difficult, we don't know. If you come to me and you have these crazy high GPAs and then you say, you know, is it likely then, or is it a target school for me to go to the school that has an 8% acceptance rate? I'm gonna tell you that all of those types of schools are going to be a reach school for you because aside from the GPA, it's gonna come down to what else you have. So hopefully that makes sense, but I have seen you know, students where it's, it's gonna be difficult to know and sometimes they have a few more reach schools just by nature of the admissions rates. And that would be targets for them, but it's just too hard to tell at this point. But I've also seen kids that are just uh, beaten down by the end of this process because they've tried to apply to too many schools. Parents that come in worried because they're not sleeping. And then we talk about the number of schools they've applied to and how many supplemental essays and their grades are suffering and their sleep is suffering. So this is the number that we recommend I know some students, and I will say some, knowing that it's probably 60% apply to a few more. But be realistic and make sure that their class, uh, their colleges that fit, and your kid will spend, you know, more time making the right application for the schools that are a good fit for them. Okay, college lists. Beware of the rankings. So a lot of people will look on US News and World Report or Niche or some of these other uh, sites. Think about it as looking at your favorite movie. My favorite movie is probably not the same as yours. Does that make our criteria wrong? Not necessarily. So understand that uh, the best colleges for our kids aren't necessarily what some ranking decided was the best college for a specific major. There's a lot of other things to consider. They're all looking at different things, okay? Uh, Well-rounded students, right? Stanford wants somebody that's well lopsided. They coined that term to mean they, they understand that there's going to be something that you're heavily invested in, but they wanna make sure that you also have some other extracurriculars. And maybe your lopsidedness is in something that you're near professional level at, like you're a world-class debater, or maybe you're well lopsided into uh, an area that you intend to go and study, but that's what they want. MIT, they don't care if you're well-rounded at all. They want to see a math or an engineering major that has just math activities as their extracurricular, math Olympiad and, uh, math club and all of these other things related to what they're wanting. Princeton brags about the fact that they really like an undecided. An undecided that can get into Princeton is a student that pretty much excels at every area and they haven't yet figured out which area they would dedicate themselves to. So you can go into those schools and just study whatever you would like. And they, that doesn't mean that you'll be there for years and years and years. You'll still graduate in the four years, but you're just encouraged to take a lot of things in a cross major situation. UCs have an average graduation rate now that's well over four years, right? You're gonna be there for five years to get an undergrad on average. In other schools that you'd go to, a fifth year could mean a master's degree. At some schools like Northeastern, you can do two co-ops or two internships for six months within the four years you're at school and you will still graduate on time. So it's really about what's important to you and what you want to have accomplished by the end of your time in school. Okay. What does it mean to have these number one ranked business programs? And it changes every year and it changes by which report you're looking at. They all look at different things. And it's really about what you think of that school more than it is about what somebody else thinks of it. Okay, but here are some other places that you can look to see some ideas on where to, you know, where to get started. Okay. I get a lot of kids that say, now I wanna to go to a good school and we figure out what that means for them. Your good fit can be related to some 
areas, specific areas, like we talked about with majors and the size of the school and things like that. So Naviance is this really expensive, cool tool that the district has invested in, and they have lots of ways to search for colleges. Um, they have this super match that allows you to look at like eight different categories. You talk about the information about yourself. Uh, you put in your scores or your GPAs, your major, all of that, and it will come up with a list of schools that you should consider. Not all the time is the information accurate. I've had kids come in um, with not as high GPAs and it's had schools on there that would not have been appropriate for them and vice versa. So take it for what it's worth, but it will help get you started. And that's where you'll be putting in schools that you're considering applying to at this point, or your students will be doing that. Okay. Common misconceptions. You shouldn't apply if we can't afford the school. If you are somebody that you think will be able to get a scholarship, if it's a super competitive school, we already talked about that. There's not often a lot of scholarship money unless you are a student in financial need, but there are a lot of other schools out there especially if you go to a school that is more of a likely for you or a target. Um, often it, there'll be offers that will have a significant discount on um, the tuition. They'll be able to give scholarship monies. Okay, shouldn't apply if it, the student doesn't fit the application or the admissions criteria. So there are exceptions to these things and we don't know what students are gonna look at. I don't know how many are out there, but um, there were a lot of disappointing grades for this semester across the country. This has not been an easy year for our students. And if we feel like, well, now this is out of our reach because of this one semester, understand that most of the rest of the country had the same situation. I got a question specifically about um, our school profile and how uh, our pass fail grades were communicated on our, to the colleges and it's right on our college uh, or on our school profile that went out to all the colleges that asked for it, that we simply told them grades were not given out last semester. It was just a pass fail. Um, some students did get grades. A lot of students across the country got pass fail. We were not the only district that did this by any means. So if you feel like your GPA isn't as competitive, they already know that this happened and they will not be penalizing our students because of it. So if you're feeling like you're not making it and it's just because of you know this, this semester or because last year's pass fail grades, that shouldn't hold you back from applying. Okay, uh, you should choose the most prestigious school you can get into. Typically, that's not a great avenue. You should pick the one that is the best fit for you. That said, if you are pre-med or pre-law or pre-something else, uh, the prestigious school for your undergrad is not your best option. You want to be able to graduate towards the top of your class to get those better opportunities in the labs and the research and the internships. You want to make sure that you go a little bit under because no one asks a doctor where they got their undergrad. They only ask them where they went to med school. And if you can position yourself towards the top of the class at whatever school you do go to, you have a much better shot at getting your pick of uh, med schools. And I've done some research on that for law school and med school, and they also want a well-rounded class for their med students. And they pick students from all over the country and different levels of school. So it doesn't give you a better shot graduating in the middle of the pack from a very prestigious school than it does graduating towards the top of the pack at a good school that isn't uh, as competitive for admissions. You also typically will save some money and medical school is expensive as is law school. Okay. You shouldn't send ACT or SAT scores until after you take them in case you do poorly. Not the case. If you know that the school is going to accept them and it is a test that you want to take, you should send them. 
if you, uh, you know, they, they will never be able to hold the information against you. Schools are only looking for ways to admit you, ways to justify admitting you over another student. Okay, so if you are sending it and it doesn't help your case, your you know score isn't what you'd hoped it would be, and your GPA carries more weight, then they won't consider it and they just put it over in neutral information. And the same goes for any other accomplishment or thing that you are thinking, maybe I shouldn't put that because it doesn't look good enough. Put everything you can. All right. Community college looked bad on a transcript or diploma. It does not at all. Uh, vast majority of you know students are starting out at community colleges in California anyway. And um, yeah, so put your co college classes on there, going to community college, especially a lot of our students are going before they even graduate. Lots and lots of students are taking courses um, early and it looks great. It looks great to attend as well um, after graduation. Okay, we can't ask the college for more money. You can, you definitely can go back and say, hey, we appreciate the offer that you've made, but this isn't going to work. <sighs> For our family, this is what we can afford. Can you meet us there? And if the student is, um, you know, one that they're really hoping to get in, then uh, they will be able to offer more sometimes. Not every time, but you may as well give it your best shot, right? All right. There's several books to be looking at right now. Websites, places that you can go to. We'll be posting this on um, on the website. I think it's already posted on the web on my website anyway. So things that you can check out now as you're doing your research. There you go. Okay. Um, colleges. This is what colleges are looking for now. Or we've gone over some of these things, but um, our extracurriculars can almost be like that that third of what they're looking at. They're gonna start with our numbers. They're gonna look at our outside activities. They're gonna look at our leadership, our plans for the future, the types of values and um, characteristics that make up our personal, you know, our personalities, our personal qualities um, as they're balancing it. And I often will tell kids, it's not necessarily just the kid that's willing to pick up the microphone and, and be the loudest. It's also the kid that comes up with the idea or comes up with the solutions or you know, figures out how you're gonna implement some ideas or things like that. There are lots of ways to be a leader um, on your application beyond just you know, being the student body president or the leader at the games or parties or whatever. Okay. Lots of different kinds of extracurricular activities. There is not a magic number um, of activities or sports or volunteer hours. And I will say too, we get a lot of students who say, you know, I've accumulated X number of volunteer hours. Colleges are not looking for that. They're looking for where you've invested your time. They're looking to see, you know, maybe freshman year, you did a lot of volunteer work, a variety of different places. And one of them was at a shelter. And you were so taken with the shelter that you decided you wanted to put in more hours there. And they were so taken with you that they decided to let you take on added responsibilities, which spurred your interest in it to create a new program that they hadn't had before and so on and so on. And then you're winding up really applying yourself, you know, you learn from them and they gave you responsibilities. And now you have, you know, this is a part of who you are and what you've learned and the things that you learned working or volunteering at this place, you'll be able to carry on with you to whatever you do in the future. So that's, that's something to keep in mind for all your extracurriculars. Um, you don't necessarily need to have research or an internship or volunteer work in another country to get admitted to colleges. Uh, internship typically is designed for a junior in college that's ready to enter the workforce. Relevant work experience is a better thing to look for, okay? Work in your field, whether you are interested in law and you are filing for a law office or you are interested in uh, politics and you volunteer for a campaign, 
or uh, you do your own personal research on a subject that interests you and take that uh, project and, and explain the process that you went through. But these things are all not necessary. They are probably what we hear about most often, but there would be an equal amount of weight to the kid who said, I didn't get to do an internship or research or volunteer in another country. I worked part-time to help my family and I uh, helped my three little brothers and sisters after school to make sure that they had, you know, that they got their homework and their after school snack and all of that until my parents came home. That carries just as much weight. Where we spend our time and what our needs are and what we prioritize all brings weight to that balance that we're trying to achieve in our student bodies when they're admitting students. Okay, don't do something just because you think it looks great. Do things because it's meaningful to you and it's going to um, enhance who you are and better prepare you for whatever, you know, whatever future you're looking at. Uh, I get a lot of kids that say they have to volunteer at a hospital. It has to be a hospital. They can't just do uh, a nursing home. They can't just do helping a neighbor. This semester, I've referred most students to looking around their neighborhood to see uh, people that aren't able to get out as much and still have, you know, they need to get out and exercise or things like that, but they can't go out by themselves and the caretakers just aren't as available because of COVID. There's plenty of ways to get out and do things that will teach them that they can, excuse me, that they can learn from. And I do post a lot of relevant, um, relevant experiences on my website uh, and through School Loop. And I try and send out a newsletter every week that kind of updates them on this is what's going on and opportunities that they have. Okay. Leadership is important, and it is, but there are lots of ways to be a leader. It isn't necessarily about those elected positions. It can also be just establishing, you know, finding a need and filling it. I think that's what I typically will tell kids, that there are lots of um, ways to look around and see what needs to be done right now. Where are people around you showing, you know, a deficit that you can do something about? Uh, I have a student this year who really wanted to help with mental health, but she didn't, you know, she saw her friends around her suffering and um, it wasn't something that was in her wheelhouse, but she decided to design some clothes and the clothes had um, slogans on the arm or on the, you know, bottom of it or on the back or something like that. And it was just inspirational uh, quotes, inspirational ideas sometimes just a couple of words. And then what she sold, she donated to, uh, you know, companies or nonprofits that were supporting mental health for students. And that was her leadership. And she was a business major, so she was running a business. Uh, and that kind of leadership was great. That was what she decided to do. And it wasn't being elected president and it didn't involve, you know, public speaking and, um, it suited just who she was. Okay, exploring interests. We talk about this in freshman year, sophomore year. Um, oh, sorry, hang on. And even now it can be important. So if you don't feel like you've got enough things on there, then there's lots of ways to learn a little bit more about yourself or electives that are being offered or classes through DVC, or there's lots of two week certificates or things like that that are available over the summers uh, that students can take advantage of, especially during COVID when so many museums are open, there's lots of places that you can go and visit virtually these days and just keep exploring the things that they're interested in. Um, I had one student or one question tonight that was about exploring majors and I can usually hone a kid in on about 25% of majors by just asking a few questions. I'll usually ask them, you know, do you, do you love math? Do you want to work with math all the time? Uh, do you love blood? 
Do you want to work with blood? Do you want to be up in front of people and talking to people, meeting new people all the time? Do you want to sit at a desk all the time? And it just kind of helps you rule out different areas that they wouldn't be interested in until you have kind of an idea. This sounds like you. Tell me about some of the things that you do in your spare time. Can you turn that into a career that would be meaningful and successful for you? So there are ways for us to uh, explore interests at this point too. Um, and if students aren't ready, like I said, there's plenty of schools like Princeton out there that really like an undecided. More kids that think they absolutely know what they're going to do for the rest of their lives still change their majors. And uh, I think the biggest major going into UCLA is pre-med and the biggest graduating major is business. So keep that in mind. It's nice to have plans and feel like you have a plan moving forward, but if it changes, that's okay too. All right, as far as essays, I've actually had some students uh, and parents contact me asking about the essays they should be writing and if they should be getting started now. You don't necessarily have to do that. A lot of people will have great, um, great experiences over this summer that they'll want to write about. And I have found most students that try and get a really early start on it wind up changing them anyway. But the students need to totally be themselves, be vulnerable, talk about uh, things that they had to overcome or uh, concerns that they had or personal growth that they really tried uh, to, you know, to develop in themselves. Um, they always say, make them really interesting. I like to weave stories together. I like to take all the things that you're interested in and find a common thread or find something you do that's interesting and then tell the perspective. I recently finished working on an essay for a kid that uh, was a scuba diver and he had dyslexia and ADHD. And we started the essay. Can you just close the door and close? I'm presenting right now. Um, so we started the essay by talking about what it felt like to be underwater and uh, not able to navigate and not have the tools. And then we compared it to what it felt like for him trying to navigate school with these learning disabilities. And it wound up being really strong. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have had that significant challenge to be able to do it. We told another one a couple of years ago about a student that loved yoga. And she talked about her life in stages of poses you know, downward facing dog and then warrior and triumphant. And it was a really great essay that talked to, you know, talked about the blending of her experiences and who she was through this lens of an activity she was interested in. Uh, don't say what you think they want to hear and say what is meaningful to the student. They really just want to feel like they know who you are and what makes you tick. Okay. Um, yeah, always a good idea to find new things to write about. So if it's already on your activities list, you don't need to write your essay about it as well, unless there's some aspect of it that you couldn't include in the activities list. And it should be on, the focus should be on you. A lot of, I think it was Princeton that said, you know, they once got an essay and it was about the girl, this girl that really loved her cat. And she talked about the cat the entire time, the great things that the cat could do, how meaningful the cat was to her. Um, it was a big part of her life. Then he said, at the end of it, I really wanted to admit the cat, but I didn't know anything about her. So make sure that your essays don't wind up being an ode to something else in their life. We hear a lot at Doherty about, you know, the influence of mom and dad, but it really should be about the student and uh, the impact maybe that some outside family members or experiences have had on them and how they learned and grew from it. Okay, so essays. All right, role of the parent. This is the big stuff. What do you do now? You uh, can help plan these college visits and by college visits, of course, right now it's virtual visits but just making time to look together at the things that are going to be important. Um, 
figuring out questions to ask and see if you can find them on the websites and if not contacting the admissions rep. And it's really easy to search for the admissions rep. You just list the school um, admissions representative by area. And then you look for where California or Northern California or depending on the school, sometimes it's Contra Costa County and you'll find that name. Um, it is time to have that open conversation about financing college, what their responsibility will be, what your uh, responsibility will be, where that puts you financially as far as which schools to apply to. I'll sometimes find students that'll say, and all they said that they, you know, they can pay for anything and they'll come in saying, I got in and it turns out that's not the case. Some schools are very expensive. You can spend half a million dollars just going to, you know, just getting your undergrad. So now is the time. Be a cheerleader. They're doing great. It's super stressful. It's not just that they're applying to college and hoping to get in. They are also preparing to leave the nest. And this can be super scary. It may look like it's really exciting, but we all remember what that was like too, right? It sounded like a great idea until we got there and then we were a little nervous for a bit. There's always going to be those ups and downs as we go through the process. Let the student drive the college search and application. I know sometimes it's tempting for us to know what's best because we've known what's best for them their whole lives, but this is actually gonna be their decision and it should be. And it is the first step of, you know, college readiness, being able to make these decisions and feel like it was their choice. You don't want them calling in a few months and saying, you guys made me go here and I don't want to be here. And they come home. And a lot of students do come home, not necessarily from Doherty, but around the country, it can be a problem. All right. Be realistic. Encourage a range of college and career options. Uh, if they're looking only at these really high-end schools and that was not an appropriate place for them, then make sure you rein it into schools that are appropriate. There are always schools out there that every student can get into. Okay, research the college options with your student, not for them. And the key word here is to encourage them, but not push them. This is a, a really stressful time for everyone. All right. As you see them go through the college admissions process, try and schedule time that they can count on that they know they're going to be meeting with you and updating you and talking about uh, college things and let them you know, suggest the time frame, but let them initiate it, figure out when it's going to work for them, what they can do. Keep in mind that the fit matters. Preserve their confidence. I've had, I had a, my own student that uh, had a rough semester and it changed uh, what was going to be possible for him, but we spent some time finding a program that made sense for him and a college that made sense for him. And it changed the way he faced the rest of his education. It may not have been what he originally thought he was going to be doing freshman year, but by the time he graduated, he was, he was able to take a lot of pride in what he was headed off to do. Um, let's see, put yourself in a position to help them make good choices. Uh, even if it's not the ones that you would have made. We need to let them make their own successes. All right, encourage, not push. All right, some things that you can look forward to in the fall, not all these dates have been set, but understand the beginning of senior year, they'll do another senior information night. There'll be a financial aid night in early October. Um, We've done a college night in recent years. We weren't able to do one this year. So I don't know what will happen for next year, but um, ideally we've always had a big college night where you can come and explore colleges. There will be lots of other fairs and there are many that are posted on the website even right now. WACAC starting to come out with some 
and uh, there will be a lot of virtual opportunities to continue. I do um, parent college information sessions. So this one will be the first one for spring, but look forward to others that will be coming in March and April and May as well. And then uh, National College Decision Day comes up on May 1st. So kids, once they are admitted, have several weeks to kind of make that final decision on where they want to go. All right, I'm going to exit uh, here. And make sure that I answered all of the questions that had been asked earlier. And I don't know if there's other questions that have been coming in as well, probably. Yeah, we've got a couple. Um, I've answered a couple. I put a couple links in the chat. Um, one thing is, can you address how senior year fall grades are considered in the college application process? Senior year fall grades. Uh, so your fall grades will go on, you know, go into your regular GPA if the regular decision date is after uh, the end of the semester, right? So if, you're, if your applications are due, like most colleges, their applications for regular decision are January, February. Um, most of our kids have applied well before that, if they're doing early or, you know, early action, early decision, or the UCs or CSUs, those are in November. Um, so if you are a borderline student for admission at some school, they may reach out and ask for your mid-year transcripts. Um, and, and then you, you know, just submit that request to your counselor and they will send those out to the schools. Um, the mid, yeah, and, and that can carry some weight with it, I guess that's, you know, ah, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know how exactly to explain it. it. It'll go in with your regular GPA and they'll, they'll use that to make the decision on going forward, you know, for admissions. And as far as the rest of the schools with the due dates in, um, you know, after the first of the year, then it's just thrown in with it. I'm sorry, my daughter's making a lot of noise. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so um, in some schools will ask for progress grades if you're applying early decision or early admission because they're not necessarily gonna calculate it into your GPA, of course, but they wanna know that you're on track, you're taking the courses you said you plan to take and are doing okay in those courses as they consider. Right. Yeah, and your grades do matter. Senior year grades definitely impact. Um, you can get any admission that you do get is considered, um, oh, what's the word? Contingent on your grades. For yeah, it. Right, so even the spring grades, they'll, they right. expect you to continue to work roughly as hard. They may not have like, you're not gonna get straight A's maybe, but if you're a straight A student, you should be getting grades commensurate with. Work. Right. So if you, yeah. So if you have really strong grades, but you slack off at the end of senior year and your grades really fall, they can actually revoke your admission. So it isn't a, uh, a sure thing. The acceptance is um, provisional in so far as they expect you to finish the courses, et cetera, right? What is the word? It's not contingent or provisional, but they say no, it not. I know. The word is right now. <laughs> I, think I think contingent. I think it's yeah. con conditional. We're, we're, we've got a that lot. That is it. Conditional. There you go. Conditional acceptance on the condition that you continue to do as well as you had. Okay. And then there were questions about Naviance and I've provided a couple of links in the chat to the, your Naviance page on the college and career website that explains what it is, their informational videos, has some logins. If people have not spent time in Naviance, um, they can go in there and start poking around and getting familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and this, it really should be student driven, but there's a place for the parents as well or sitting next to the student to talk through it. Yeah. And parents have a separate login for themselves. So they say that the students will do it and the parents can view it. Um, 
if you're a parent that is really interested in how Naviance works, maybe we'll do that for next month and we can do a you know, informational meeting about how to navigate in that. And you can use it for research tool. It's a good tool. So as a parent of a senior who, have, who has just spent a lot of time and learned so much more through the process than anything I might have prepared for, um, we use Naviance for the research. We use Naviance to help draft you know, the resume and pull together certain information. I know there's so many tools there, but the one that ultimately I didn't realize was that's where that's, we use Naviance as kind of the portal or communication tool to officially request letters of recommendation, officially request the counselor letter, right? And then our, the, our Naviance system connects with the college app, et cetera, so that when you applied, I'm sorry, the common app, when you apply under the common app, if your letters of recommendation were requested not through Naviance, they get submitted through Naviance and then they come into the common app and it confirms that they've received them. So it's the tool our school uses, right? In order to do certain things that we need from teachers or counselors, et cetera. Is that, is there, are there other things like we, you have to submit applications through it. So it's a good idea if your kid is getting frustrated with it too, to just kind of have a good idea of, of how it works and being able to run around. I like looking at Road Trip Nation. I like looking at our chances for admissions and getting a better idea because some for some of our more popular schools, um, if the admissions rate is really low, you may think that you're going to have a decent shot at it and then understand that we're really competing against ourselves here, our Doherty students. And, um, and sometimes that can affect and impact admissions as well. Okay. And so the process with Naviance is you're not actually applying through Naviance, but Naviance, you connect Naviance to common app so they can talk to each other. Right. And then information flows. And it's how a lot of the documentation gets submitted for the app, you know, yeah. So one of the questions that's coming up are how do students get access to the Naviance account? How do parents um, get access to theirs? And one question is parents don't log into their students' Naviance. Parents have a, a sister right. account essentially where, but you can certainly sit with your student and see what they see, right? As I mean, maybe people- Yeah, you can see what they're doing through your own login too. So parents have their own login and students have their own login. Now they're able to log in straight through the SRVUSD uh, main website with just their student login. Like so, the so the students, and, and also you can, if there's also a Naviance link that says it's for parents, but you can click student, parent, whatever for your login. And so apparently there's a registration code for parents and I, how do they get access to it if they haven't used it? It's gotten lost in email, I think maybe at previous Right, events. they were emailed to them originally freshman year. Um, we get a lot that don't have it anymore um, and those can be reset. So usually after this meeting, I spend the next day resetting passwords for everyone. <laughs> um, so yes. Go so ahead. Email you, email you if they need help accessing Naviance. But please, if it's the registration code, definitely contact or need a password reset, contact Mrs. Wright. But otherwise, maybe start with the page we mentioned um, to just understand a little bit about Naviance, and that will help you right um, before you get in. And then, I can tell you, tell you now, you, um, I don't have a registration code, but I can reset your uh, registration. So the codes that were sent out a long time ago, those are, those are done and I haven't, I, I don't send them out either, um, but I can reset them and I will usually be resetting 20 or 30 of them tomorrow. So I anticipate that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, another question, again, calculating GPA or grade conditions. Um, when you take middle school algebra or Spanish one, Etc. They show up on your transcript. You get a check mark that yes, you fulfilled that requirement. Mm -hmm. But are the grades considered at all in college admission? Nope. Whether you got A's or B's doesn't matter. We won't go into your GPA because it was too soon. 
you just have the credit for the class and validated by the next level up that you took. Okay. So we're getting to the end here. Do we have um, we, one or two final questions that we- I need? have some on here too that I realized I didn't talk about. Somebody asked about letters of recommendation from uh, teachers and when they should start asking. Some teachers will start their list in late spring, but I also know students that said, I talked to the teacher in spring, they said yes, but now they're out. Uh, you know, they're out of space in the fall. So you can talk to them now, but the real, you know, most of them are starting their list and they're actually taking down names at the beginning of the school year for senior year. And you want to pick these, they want to, students want to pick these teachers by um, the relationship that they have with them, not necessarily someone where they just got an A. Uh, one of the best ones we had was a student who got very ill during uh, her junior year and the teacher, you know, she didn't get an A in the class, but the teacher talked about how hard she tried to work despite being ill and really had a clear picture of the work ethic of the student and the struggles that she had gone through. And it made a much better letter of rec. So keep that in mind. Um, they, somebody else asked about receiving transcripts. Um, once the student had been accepted to a college, at the end of senior year, they do a senior checkout sheet and they tell the um, counseling department where they are going to school the following year and those transcripts will be sent out to those schools, your final transcripts. Um, let's see. I wanna make sure that I got everything else. Did you get another one? No, I think I, I've been responding to some of them. Um, I did also send a link to this year's school profile that was provided for this year's seniors. And a lot of your questions may be answered looking at that link. It's for the 2020-21 uh, school year. So it's current seniors, the colleges to which they apply will get this. And it includes the mention of the um, T spring 2020 pass no pass situation explains the honors, um, the uh, uh, AP class, how things are graded, there's no ranking. So people should definitely look at that link. All of this information is on the DVHS college and career website. And as a parent of a senior, I highly encourage you to spend some time and just go through that whole section and get familiar with it to you. A lot of the information is right there or it will help you fine tune um, your questions. We have had people asking about um, taking the SAT while many schools, at least for this year have been test optional. And of course the UCs are not looking at SAT scores um, in anticipation that they may count next year or that juniors may want to take the SAT because it may enhance their resume um, and they may be struggling to get the SAT course because of COVID. The question was, is the district looking at providing the SAT test to those rising seniors so that they have that as an option, though the district as a rule doesn't provide it, doesn't administer it. And I saw the email that actually came from you. <laughs> you were able to reach uh, Greg Duran to, uh, today. And the uh, if it is necessary and testing is still inaccessible for students in the fall, seniors will again be allowed to take it in the fall. Um, the idea, of course, we are desperately hoping is that the you know, vaccine will work and that we will be able to get back into our regular classes and testing facilities will be open and resume as they had before. So that's the goal now, but should we find ourselves in the same situation that we were in this fall, then the plan would be to um, offer the test again. I think the district understands they don't want people like me having to travel all the way to Rhode Island so my son could take the SAT, which we did. Um, mm -hmm. So though normal, this is not gonna become the norm to my knowledge, they are looking at providing that opportunity to make sure people have the option. 
So one of the questions is if you get an SAT or an ACT score that you're not particularly proud of, but it's the only one you're able to take, should you submit it? Yes. If you've taken it, submit it. Um, it may not represent uh, what you think you could have done, but uh, it's not going to hurt you. Like I said, colleges are really only looking for ways to admit you. So if the information isn't going to help your application and the fact that you even try to take it may be something that helps the application, who knows, depends on the school, um, then they will, if they can't use it to help you, they put it in neutral information. It doesn't work against you. Anything you submit can only help you. And definitely look at the fine print for what the colleges do say, because some of them will say, you don't have to submit it. But if you do, and you tell us you want us to use the scores, then that's where we, we may use them. And or if you submit one, we expect you to submit them all. Some schools will let you just submit what you want, but just look and see what the school says. Right. Oh, you should ask two, two letters of recommendation. Teachers are two letters of recommendation and it can depend on your major, which teachers, but in general, you want to balance. So if you're going to be more of a People history. Asking a, sorry. Oh, um, so just, yeah. So just have a balance. Typically I will say, don't do both of them as math and science. Um, make sure that you use an English or a history as a balance and vice versa. If you're gonna be more of a history person, don't make both of them English and history. And that's it. Get on track and get credit for individual research. I did have another um, question too about tips for finding remote internships or as related to like research or things like that. If you're looking to, if, uh, if your student is looking to get um, relevant work experience, then have, uh, have them reach out to me and we can talk through it because it would depend on the area and what they were looking for if something's even possible. Um, again, internship has a different connotation, but relevant work experience is still pretty accessible if they're willing to do the legwork to put something together for themselves. And I can usually find something, you know, that's good, uh, good for their resume, depending on their major. So uh, Jen, we're just about 8.50 and I wanna respect your time. Um, you do have, uh, students have the ability to schedule appointments with you. Yes. And can start asking questions, maybe gather up their list of questions. And um, is that something that the students should drive and the parents can participate in? Yeah, and we've had a lot more parents come this year and that's been fine with me. Um, but yes, you have to make an appointment. The student has to make the appointment because I can only take appointments through an SRV USD email anyway. <laughs> so yeah, just so uh, they can make the appointment and I'm available all kinds of times a day and um, it can't be during class time, but any other time outside of that, I think I have lunch on there as well and after school and before school. So whatever works for them. Um, and if it starts to fill up, then I will uh, open up an evening again. I did that. Those appointments at this point are via Zoom, right? Yes. Yeah. Everything's via Zoom. Talking to me live in my own house. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter screaming and my son coming home from practice and sorry. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this again. It has been my pleasure. I've had the opportunity to do this with Jennifer a few times and I'm still learning things. Luckily I have a freshman, so I'll get um, more knowledge put to use and particularly after my experience with my seniors. So thank you so much for providing this information. And again, as a parent that's just gone through this, I can tell you so much of the information is on that website and I recognize it so much better now You'll be ahead of the curve if you're able to go through and kind of read through it, then follow up perhaps with some questions or meeting and it'll make a lot more sense. But um, I will tell you that the district and um, DVHS are here with the parents. Mrs. Wright has been incredibly available to so many. You just have to ask. Um, 
and get on that appointment. Probably she's more busy now with Zoom because <laughs> it's so much easier to make appointments. So thank you again. Um, this uh, presentation is on YouTube. So if you missed a portion of it, you can certainly go back and um, watch it again. And otherwise, if you have questions of Mrs. Wright, you can email them to her or, or your student can schedule an appointment. Thank Great. you again, everybody. And thank you, Mrs. Wright.